Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Wild Science webinar for June 2021. Uh, if I could get everybody to mute your microphones, we'll get this thing started. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Remember that uh, this is being recorded and will be uh, posted to the Game and Fish YouTube channel uh, for public consumption here in the next day or two. Uh, looking forward today to hearing from Marcus Asher and Brian Wagner. Uh, Marcus will be talking about quail focal areas and Brian will be uh, presenting uh, mapping the way to aquatic conservation partnerships. I believe uh, Marcus drew the short straw and will go first today. Uh, Marcus is, of course, the agency's quail program coordinator working out of the Jonesboro Regional Office. Marcus got his Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Ecology and Management at Arkansas State University. He's been with Game and Fish for five years prior to uh, assuming the role of Quail Program Coordinator. He was Area Manager at St. Francis Sunken Lands WMA, and uh, prior to joining Game and Fish, he was a private lands conservationist at the Missouri Department of Conservation. Uh, Marcus's presentation is Quail Focal Areas, the Anchors We Build Upon. Marcus, take it away, sir. Thank you, Trey. I will pull up my presentation. Does that, that look good? We got you. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll step right into this. I can get it to advance. It is not advancing. Sorry about this. Here we go. That that scrolled through. Yeah, we've got it now, Marcus. Thank you. Okay. Good deal. Okay, so uh, focal areas. Uh, what what do I mean by focal area, and, and why are we uh, taking this kind of tiered approach uh, to habitat restoration in Arkansas? Um, so myself and uh, several staff are a part of a, a national uh, organization called the National Bible Life Technical Committee. Uh, one product that they have brought uh, from that committee, it's it's over 25 states that are involved. They're unified, trying to trying to fix the problems with, with quail throughout the range. Uh, but one of the products that they have uh, implemented or uh, brought to the forefront is a coordinated implementation uh, program. Uh, this is where all the states uh, are, uh, you know, doing monitoring all on the same page, all the same uh, type of protocol, uh, and. As you'll see later on, uh, you know, most of it is, is tiered around or geared around uh, songbird point counts and fall covey counts. Uh, but again, it's a national, nationally implemented uh, protocol. The purpose of this, uh, from our standpoint, is uh, to provide a foundation, a place for, just like when you start a house, you, you, you build a foundation so that you have a strong uh, foothold uh, and you uh, work off of that essentially. Uh, also, I think these focal areas, in my opinion, are, a, are good places for us as an agency to provide education, uh, outdoor education, in-person education uh, for not only private lands, um, you know, private landowners, but also uh, for other agencies uh, that are potentially going to implement uh, some of this habitat work as well. It gives them a chance to see what we're doing, uh, go through and, and um, you know, have conversations about how how we go about implementing these things, uh, these habitat practices, and also showcase uh, what we're doing. You know, showcase that these things actually do work. Uh, that habitat is the key to uh, restoring quail in, in Arkansas. Habitat restoration is, uh, but at a focal area scale, uh, meaning, and what I mean by that, a focal area, uh, looking at anywhere from like fifteen hundred to 
uh, five, 5,000, maybe up to 8,000 uh, acres. Uh, but this is achievable. Uh, it's achievable in, in our, you know, my career, uh, but it's also achievable as far as, you know, prov providing timely results uh, so that folks can see uh, fairly soon uh, what, you know, what success uh, can be achieved uh, through doing this habitat work. It also allows us to have some certain areas throughout the state uh, that we can incentivize uh, so that surrounding properties uh, can implement, uh, more readily implement habitat in a uh, cooperative manner, so to speak, or a, um, a, uh, a surrounding, you know, a surrounding property effect, so to speak. Uh, and this, this focal area uh, tiered approach allows us to uh, better evaluate our success. If we started out and said, hey, we're gonna uh, restore quail on the entire, in the entire state of Arkansas, uh, that would be extremely, extremely difficult to evaluate uh, the, su the success of a project because it wouldn't happen uh, overnight uh, and it wouldn't, definitely wouldn't happen in numerous years as well. So at a smaller scale, we're able to better evaluate our success. Uh, this is this, this focal area or focal tier approach uh, in kind of a depiction here. Uh, you start out with this focal area in green. Uh, this, is, this actually happens to be one of our focal areas. It's the south end of Harold Alexander uh, or Spring River Harold Alexander WMA uh, up in Sharp County. Uh, but the, the hope is to obviously build habitat on this foundation or this core uh, property. Uh, on the WMA and then incentivize uh, landowners around this area to hopefully build more and more habitat within this, what's called what we deem as a focal landscape. Uh, so we go from, you know, this 1,500 to 5,000 acres uh, that is the focal area to tens of thousands of acres on this uh, focal landscape. Uh, and then eventually over time, uh, many, many years uh, down, down the road, uh, expand this off onto, um, you know, or, or I guess increase it onto a county, a county scale uh, in which uh, there's a lot of, or a, a tremendous amount of acreage uh, within this focal region is being implemented into uh, good quail habitat over time. And it's not just a step-by-step -step process. This is going to happen um, these improvements on focal areas and focal landscapes and regions are going to you know, be improved uh, over the same time period, but we're all focusing it in on uh, certain areas within the state so that we can have a contiguous, uh, a more contiguous um, uh, habitat out there on the landscape. Here's what I mean by incentivizing. We've already kind of started this process. Uh, Harold Alexander, uh, we have uh, three different funding sources that I know we incentivize right now. Uh, we have a, a regional conservation partnership program um, in that in the Sharp and, and kind of the northern part of the state. Uh, we also have Working Lands for Wildlife and uh, Equip, uh, which are all are all farm bill programs that provide financial assistance to private landowners uh, to implement habitat work um, in, within the state. And these dots on here uh, represent different landowners who have signed up for programs and implemented habitat work. So you can see how over time, this is just in its infancy. You know, we've only been uh, had sign up periods for I think it's two, uh, two years now for a lot of these programs to, that are being incentivized uh, surrounding these WMAs. Uh, but you can see how this will eventually over time will fill in uh, with a lot of good, uh, good habitat work. And if, and if you're familiar with the uh, meta population theory, uh, for how populations expand. Um, obviously, the closer uh, habitat tracks are to a source population, which is what we hope to have in, in uh, Harold Alexander, uh, the more easily it is for individuals to disperse or um, uh, emigrate onto other properties and expand uh, from there and take advantage of that newly created habitat. So within the state, we have uh, seven different focal areas. Uh, Robert L. Hankins Mud Creek, it's about a thousand acres. Harold Alexander, 
uh, is much, much larger than what the actual focal area is, uh, but our focal area is around 5,000 acres uh, that were focused uh, or have focused uh, habitat work occurring. Uh, Stone Prairie is just shy of 1,000 acres. Uh, Jack Mountain is around that 1,066 acres. Uh, Hope Upland is about 2,100 acres. Little Bayou is 1,200, and then Pea Ridge is about 2,700 uh, in which we're monitoring for about a total of 14,291 acres uh, total. So in order to uh, evaluate our success of, of what's going on habitat wise on uh, our, our WMAs or on that uh, Pea Ridge Military Park, uh, we have selected two different means uh, to evaluate this. One mean is uh, the spring, through the use of spring bird point counts. Um, we, uh, do conduct these counts on 65 different locations throughout those seven focal areas. Uh, these, these locations are selected or the number of locations are selected based on the amount of acreage on the WMA. Uh, the goal is to strive for uh, capturing 25% uh, in which we are monitoring, 25% of the overall acreage that we're monitoring. Uh, so an example, Jack Mountain is one of the smaller uh, WMAs that we uh, do counts on and, and we conduct four points on there. Uh, and the largest one that we do is Harold Alexander. Uh, we're monitoring uh, about 3,500 acres on there and that requires us to do 18 uh, point counts. Uh, these, these bird point counts are conducted during the time frame of May 15th to June 30th. Uh, each point count is sampled for a five minute period uh, from sunrise to 10 a.m. And then we replicate these bird point counts three times to try to avoid or to try to uh, reduce the observer uh, and weather biases and things based on you know when, when these uh, uh, particular counts are uh, actually conducted. And this this uh, will provide us with an index uh, of what the population is doing from year to year. And then eventually, uh, as we get enough samples uh, and detections, uh, we will develop a density estimate. Some of the birds that we uh, count during these, because we don't we don't count the entire suite of, of species. Uh, I wanted folks to more focus on uh, species that are indicative of the type of habitat that we want to create. This grassland, early successional, uh, open woodland type uh, habitat, and so thus we selected indigo buntings, uh, yellow-breasted chats, painted buntings, field sparrows, quail. Uh, bells, vireos, and, and so forth. There's actually about 14 different species that we look for, but I won't list all of them. So the other uh, way that we sample uh, is uh, to, to measure success on these focal areas is through fall covey counts uh, for, for quail. Uh, these are more time intensive. Uh, they take each individual 45 minutes uh, before sunrise to sunrise. Uh, past that sunrise time frame, uh, quail do not typically uh, make this uh, fall covey, uh, this um, uh, fall covey noise or, or sound. Um, they, the time frame in which these fall covey counts are conducted is October 1st through November 10th. Uh, they're again replicated three times uh, throughout that time period. Um, and so, uh, the sampling range is from anywhere from three points to six points are conducted on each WMA throughout that time frame. So results from our uh, sampling uh, during the spring at Harold Alexander, we're seeing uh, a definite increase in indigo buntings and chats. We're even seeing some of these less, what I call less common uh, uh, species appearing. Uh, such as painted bunting and prairie warbler, these folks or these types of um, birds need uh, more specific habitat types, more specific habitat characteristics that are starting to come on as we do more burning and uh, more uh, timber thinning. Uh, but we're also seeing, obviously, our focus or emphasis, the, the northern Bob Whites, we are seeing a definite increase in the number of species that we're, we're hearing on, uh, on Herald or near Herald. Uh, we weren't hearing any in 2017, and now we're hearing an average of three, a little over three per day. 
Uh, in fact, we're seeing not only uh, we're hearing more quail, but we're hearing quail on more points. Uh, we started out again not hearing any, uh, and now we're hearing uh, quail on 22% of the points that we sample. Uh, I will give the caveat though that most of these uh, these uh, quail that we're hearing up up to this point have been on private land just adjacent to the to the WMA, uh, just west of the WMA. Uh, but this past year, uh, I actually heard and saw uh, the first quail uh, on on the uh, WMA in 2020. So so definitely encouraging there. Along with that, during the fall. Uh, during that fall of 2020, uh, we actually heard our first two coveys on the on the WMA uh, in in one particular day uh, in in that year. So quite quite encouraging there, hearing none, and now we're starting to hear uh, now up to two coveys so far. Uh, our spring counts in on the Hope Upland WMA uh, again, we're seeing uh, an increase in indigo buntings and chats. These are a little more what I would consider common uh, type species uh, as far as early successional. Uh, birds go, uh, but we are seeing uh, more of the suite of grassland species, so getting more of those habitat characteristics that are kind of these niche uh, habitats for as far as like dick sissels and indigo, uh, excuse me, eastern kingbirds and, and meadowlarks and painted buntings. Unfortunately, we have not heard any quail on uh, Hope Upland. Um, I, I think this may be due to the surrounding uh, habitat types. It's mostly all closed canopy pine plantations or uh, very, very close, closely grazed uh, pastures, uh, which does not lend itself well for, for quail. In the fall, uh, there was one covey picked up in 2017, uh, or heard in 2017, uh, but it has since dropped off. Uh, I think this, this um, could be a, a product of, of just you know, you, you have one kind of just hanging on there and or, or near there because I think it was actually on uh, adjacent property uh, where this one was heard, uh, but it's so low of, of the population size that it may have blinked out before it could really be able to take advantage of our, our habitat work there. Our spring results on Jack Mountain, uh, WMA, this is kind of a smaller one. Uh, that we do this is just a little over a thousand acres uh, but we're seeing similar trends indigo buntings and field sparrows are increasing uh, northern bob whites uh, have dropped off slightly although again bob whites are a cyclical species uh, so depending on the weather uh, that you may have in one particular spring um, you may see you know reduced amount of reproduction uh, and so thus i think that's maybe what occurred at 18 on the area and so it's the population is still trying to uh, recover uh, from possibly that that weather event, uh, but it hasn't dropped off much. We were picking up an average of two per day uh, sampling in 2017, and we're down to only just just over uh, or just at one and a half per day in 2020. We're seeing quite the opposite though on our fall. Uh, Covey count results uh, 2017 uh, to now has increased um, really three threefold uh, in the number of coveys per day. Uh, and in fact, here in 2020, we heard uh, staff heard six different coveys in one particular uh, sampling event. Spring results for Little Bayou, uh, again, another trend, indigo buntings and chats are really taking advantage of this habitat. Uh, but I think it's indicative of this area uh, in that we really went full bore uh, on this particular WMA, a lot of heavy, heavy thinnings down to from, from a basal area of over, uh, probably over 100 down to 30 to 40 uh, basal area, and then even expanding off of some of the existing smaller uh, fields expanding off of those to create some really quite larger uh, grassland systems uh, and you can see that there's a lot of suite of uh, species there are a lot of different individuals bells vireos dick sissels um, grasshopper sparrows prairie warblers that are not always or haven't always been picked up in some of the other areas uh, and in fact again the 
the uh, northern Bob Whites per day has increased from we didn't hear any in 2017 uh, to hearing an average of three and a half um, uh, per day. All Covey count results for Little Bayou, uh, we're seeing, uh, again, uh, just a very consistent increase in the number of coveys heard. Uh, none were heard in 2017, and now we hear an average of uh, just over two and a half coveys per day, uh, with a high of three coveys heard in, in one particular uh, sampling event. <clears throat> Spring results at Mud Creek WMA. This is again another smaller one. Um, very consistent uh, increases in several species, uh, all of which um, again have, have increased substantially. Uh, we did hear initially two northern Bob Whites I heard on sampling uh, during the spring. Uh, they were off the area, again, similar to uh, the Hope Upland uh, cases. And we have yet to hear a Bob White sense on, on the area itself. Uh, so I don't know if something happened on that private land and it, um, it knocked out our, our two quail or, or something like that or some type of weather event or something and just couldn't, they couldn't take advantage of our, of our, uh, our, our area there. But um, anyways, uh, it was only two though that we were hearing. Again, we heard one covey at Mud Creek uh, during that initial year. Uh, and then the, the coveys have, have since uh, ceased to, to be detected. Pea Ridge, uh, one of our larger areas, 2,700 acres in which we're monitoring. Species diversity is very high. Uh, several, uh, several species that aren't always detected uh, in the other areas. Uh, I think this is indicative of the, the existing state. Uh, there was al already some fair uh, habitat present uh, there's uh, the surrounding landscape is is more open, uh, more in a grassland uh, type landscape. Um, but overall, most of the species are increasing uh, here, and uh, of course, the Bob Whites uh, have have increased since 2018. We started with hearing three per day, and now we're up to 4.33 uh, Bob Whites per day. This is another one that where we initially only heard a quail on two different points on this, and they've started to essentially expand onto the further onto more of the uh, of the park itself, and we're hearing quail on five different points now. Uh, kind of the population, at least in the fall, is showing to be basically stable. Uh, in eighteen, we did had have, have a an event that set it back. Uh, the park, you know, as part of their uh, funding source, uh, they have hay leases, and so they hayed most all of the uh, grasslands uh, that particular year. And so I definitely think that had an influence on that, that zero uh, herd in the fall. Uh, but I think they, they went off of the, the park and were able to, for the most part, most of them were able to survive and come back uh, the following year, um, but we are at about 1.33 coveys on average uh, heard per day, uh, with a high of four coveys heard uh, in one particular sampling event. And then finally, uh, to to finish up uh, the, the WMA Stone Prairie in uh, Faulkner County, there is showing very similar trends: the number of chats and field sparrows, uh, prairie warblers coming on uh, to be detected here as well as some of the other species, Eastern Meadowlark and Kingbird, are showing these increases. Uh, Northern Bob Whites have shown an increase uh, from very few in 2018 to now hearing just over uh, two and a half Bob Whites per day uh, during the spring. Um, the uh, fall populations are showing a little bit of a decline, uh, although it's if you look at the magnitude, it's going from hearing uh, an average of two and a half to now just one uh, per day, uh, but we are still maintaining uh, a high of hearing three coveys heard per uh, sampling day. Uh, so really not much has changed, although there, there may be a little bit of weather that has influenced some of these, uh, some of this a little bit decline uh, locally, uh, but overall, uh, I think as I'll discuss, things that are up and up. For the most part. 
Uh, songbirds, to, to kind of go into an overall discussion, uh, songbirds and quail are definitely responding to the habitat manipula manipulations on our focal areas. Uh, I think it's important that we, um, if we, in the future, when we start adding on possibly more focal areas, uh, we definitely try our best. I know it may not be always the case to find a WMA that we own or a uh, public property that we own that's adjacent to areas that have either have quail uh, or private lands that have quail. Um, but uh, it's definitely important to locate those focal areas close to uh, an existing quail population uh, because uh, as literature suggests, you know, a mile or two is typically uh, a long ways for, for quail to disperse, believe it or not. Uh, that's why we, that's one reason we included a lot of songbird monitoring is because those are more typically able to expand um, and, and migrate on to focal areas quicker than, than quail are. I definitely think weather, uh, observer bias, and, um, and quail uh, themselves uh, can affect our detection of, of, of them and other songbirds. I think not only from a weather standpoint of, of you know, having reproduction from spring to fall, uh, but also the particular day in which sampling occurs uh, plays a big part in this. And I know, you know, staff have time constraints and um, and it's hard to get, you know, the three of these replications sometimes in. So, but definitely keep keep an eye on that and, and be able to do the best we can as far as picking the, the best days. Uh, and then just anecdotally, I haven't compared this to Rob uh, Rob's habitat database. I uh, hope to do that in the next few years, but um Canopy closure and the amount of existing grassland habitat are definitely key uh, to seeing these quicker responses. Uh, the more canopy um, opening that you have, um, uh, the, the more it seems like these uh, early successional species are responding. Takeaways for uh, staff in general uh, from, from what we do, uh, songbirds and quail are good indicators of ecosystem health. Uh, not only are they, uh, not only are we seeing these particular uh, species that we picked out, but many, many other species are, are being benefited by simply creating this type of, um, this habitat type that is often declining. Grasslands and early seasonal habitat are one of the most uh, threatened and declining uh, habitats in the world today. Um, also, habitat restoration, despite what most people probably throw out to you guys, to staff, uh, habitat restoration is the most influential component of quail recovery. If we do not have uh, those habitat characteristics present, uh, it doesn't matter how much, um, you know, trapping you do or, or supplemental feeding or whatever other thought there is. Um, they're just not, the species is not able to, to take advantage of that habitat and be able to grow the population and reproduce. Um, focal areas, again, are just our starting point. We want to, the goal is to expand uh, into more of a landscape scale size because that's truly how we're going to get larger populations of birds because only so much, only so many acres of that focal area uh, can be inhabited by uh, a certain amount of birds uh, and then they have to expand off. And so the key is to get private landowners and other agencies involved uh, so that we can make the best possible uh, increases overall. I encourage staff to use focal areas as outdoor classrooms. Uh, we can learn uh, from, you know, and, we, and the public can learn from this. Uh, take, you know, I encourage you to take folks out here and set up field days and, and things like that so that uh, we can share this information with the public and other, other agency folks. Uh, and again, as, as any study uh, or project worthwhile doing, uh, monitoring is a critical uh, component of this to be, to be able to be adaptive, you know, to know you know, what kind of success are we having? Do we need to change what we're doing uh, so that we are achieving what we set out to do? So with that, I conclude and I will take some, some questions. Thank you, Marcus. Um, we will open it up to questions now. If anybody's got any, feel free to, uh, to jump in, uh, unmute and then uh, jump in. Uh, we do have one in the comments from Blake Sassy. <laughs> Is where, Marcus, where would you say we are on the way toward achieving our quail habitat management goals on the focal WMAs? Is there still a way to go to get where we would expect to see a significant bird response? 
Uh, I still think there, as far as overall, now there's some of the smaller WMAs, we're probably uh, hitting our goal of habitat acres. Uh, but as you can see, some of those like Mud Creek, for instance, we, we're definitely gonna have to do more uh, research and figure out, you know, what, why are we not getting, uh, getting the bird response that we want. But definitely habitat wise, we are getting there on those smaller ones. Now, some of the larger ones like Harold Alexander, I think there's still some, some um, and Harold Alexander and Hope Upland, there's still some uh, room to improve on some of those uh, habitat acres that are still basically closed canopy forest. Thank you, Marcus. Any uh, other questions? All right. No more questions. Uh, you get a thumbs up from uh, Holly Sanders uh, for the uh, suggestion of making these focal areas outdoor classrooms. Uh, all right. Well, uh, Marcus, thank you so much. We appreciate uh, that presentation. Appreciate the work you're doing uh, on these focal areas and uh, elsewhere around the state. We will uh, move on to the second presenter now. Brian Wagner uh, from Fisheries. Uh, Brian was is a native of Lawrence, Kansas, and stayed close to home to earn his bachelor's degree in systematics from the University of Kansas. Uh, he went on to earn a master's degree in fisheries from Virginia Tech before joining the Game and Fish Commission as assistant fisheries research biologist in 1989. Uh, after the conservation sales tax passed in 96 and uh, 98, Brian became the first member of what is now called the Aquatic Wildlife Diversity Program. He had a brief stand as interim assistant chief in fisheries and then returned to the field where he has continued to research aquatic species. And uh, of note, uh, on July 1st, which I think, uh, if I count right, is 24 days away, uh, Brian will be retiring after 32 years with the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, and he plans to pursue diverse interests, including fishing, gardening, brewing, woodworking, genealogy, and uh, says he'll still probably dabble a little bit in fish and crayfish biology. Brian will be presenting Mapping the Way to Aquatic Conservation Partnerships. Brian, take it away. Hey, thank you, Trey. Let's see if I can remember how to get this presentation up. There it is. Brian, right now we're we're seeing the uh, the window uh, form with the slides. Just just so you know. Okay, now is that still the case? As of now, but we'll give it a second. There's uh, typically a a little bit of a lag. All right. Yeah, we've still got the, the the panel with the individual slides to the left, and, and okay. not up oh, here. We're, we're trying it again. There, there we yeah. Go. There we go. You got it now, Brian. Excellent. All right, well, today I will discuss efforts to improve our understanding of species distribution and how that has led to conservation efforts. I always like to thank other people first. So I wanna start off by acknowledging all of the staff of Arkansas Game and Fish and our partner state and federal agencies and conservation groups that have worked with me over the years. Your assistance was critical and I would have accomplished little alone. Specifically, I'd like to recognize Justin Stroman of Arkansas Game and Fish, Dustin Lynch of the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission, and Mike Slay of the Nature Conservancy. They should be considered co-authors on much of this work. When I was approached about this talk, the proposed topic was career accomplishments. Well, over my career, I've worked in statewide roles all across Arkansas with many of our 58 crayfish and 243 fish species. 
It's going through my records. I listed here species that I've been involved in focused research on. So there's not sufficient time today for me to talk about all of these. So I decided to highlight a few and the conservation efforts that our distribution surveys have led to. When I became Game and Fish's first non-game aquatics biologist 23 years ago, I was staggered by the basic information that we lacked on the species that are not sought for by anglers. In some cases, a species was only known from the places where it was originally described. This can give an erroneous view of how rare a species might be. Additionally, location information is key to implementing species conservation. I did a query of our species databases and found that I had contributed to nearly 7,000 distribution records during my career, which is what I'm showing on this map. One of the first relatively unknown species I worked with was Williams crayfish. Williams crayfish is a rare stream-dwelling crayfish that is endemic to the upper White River Basin of Arkansas and Missouri. It was described in the 1960s from Madison County, Arkansas. And for a long time, the three localities named in the description comprised the published range of the species in the state. This had only increased to the five on this map by the time I started looking at this crayfish. In contrast, 27 locations were reported in Missouri at that time. The difference here being that Missouri Department of Conservation has long had a dedicated crayfish biologist and a crayfish survey crew sampling crayfish populations across their state. Our study began in 2004. Initially, we surveyed 68 randomly selected stream crossings in the upper White River Basin, resulting in greatly expanding the species range in Arkansas. Shown in pink on the map are locations that have been added for this species since this study initiated focused searches for them. We even confirmed the species in some unexpected habitats, including a concrete lined ditch portion of Leatherwood Creek in Eureka Springs. This prompted citizens to propose using it as a poster child for groundwater protection in the area. You can find these plaques marking stormwater drains in the town. The Northwest Arkansas Corridor is the fastest growing part of the state, with Bentonville, Rogers, and Fayetteville being Arkansas's three fastest growing cities. In the most recently reported statistics, Bentonville grew by over 50% in less than 10 years. This area is also home to the Arkansas and Least Darters two of the state's rarest fish. Both of these darters have more expansive ranges outside of the state. Arkansas darters are found in the Arkansas River Basin as far west as Colorado. They were previously a candidate for Endangered Species Act listing, but in 2016 were found not to warrant protection due to the healthy population in South Central Kansas. Lease starters are found in states around the Great Lakes with a disjunct population in part of the Ozarks in Missouri, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. They are considered apparently extirpated from the state of Kansas, critically imperiled in Arkansas and Iowa, and imperiled in Michigan and Missouri. Within Arkansas, these darters were only known from a handful of locations in Benton and Washington counties in slower flowing, vegetated, spring-fed creeks 
flowing into the Arkansas River Basin. Initially, my work targeted Arkansas darters due to their Endangered Species Act candidate status at the time. So we pulled out our old school GIS system here and searched for likely locations these fish might be within the Arkansas River Basin portions of these two counties. This was a challenge because these fish occupy small spring runs, and many of these are not shown on available maps. Despite searching springs we identified across much of these two counties, we only found these darters in a few places within the Illinois River Basin near the previously documented locations. So we changed our approach and started searching in areas spreading out from the known locations and expanded our efforts to be looking for lease darters as well. As we got a better picture of the type of habitats they were found in, we were able to seek out new places to search based on on-the-ground observations facilitated by local biologists with the Nature Conservancy. More recently, Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission botanist Theo Wetzel noted parallels between the unique habitats these fish occupy and rare plant communities in the area, pointing us to other areas to search yielding new records for these fish. So over the past 18 years, we've been able to build this more detailed map of where these two fish occur in the state. Some of these populations appear to be fairly isolated and are even more isolated from those in other states. We also worked with St. Louis University to examine the genetics of these darters. This diagram shows the different least darter genetic forms, with each line segment representing one mutational change difference. As you can see, Arkansas populations are separated from others by 62 mutations, differing from the northern populations by nearly 8%. This agrees with research across the range of lease starters by Dr. Anthony E. Kelly from Oklahoma State University, who concluded that Arkansas populations likely represent an unrecognized species. Dr. Brooke Fluker at Arkansas State is in the process of describing this new species, which will be unique to Arkansas. As far as Arkansas darter, our genetic results indicated that Arkansas populations differed from nearby ones in Missouri. Range-wide genetic research on Arkansas darters is ongoing, but preliminary results suggest that those in Arkansas may also be a unique species. Having developed a better picture of local distribution for these two fish, allowed us to work with the Nature Conservancy to develop a conservation action plan. We were able to look at each area and identify conservation issues specific to that location. Some of these areas are in pastures, on golf courses, in areas of residential development, or experiencing erosion due to increased runoff from impervious surface upstream. Since the completion of this plan, partners have stepped in to address some of these issues, which I will highlight in the remainder of this presentation. Wilson Spring is a tributary of Clabber Creek on the edge of Fayetteville. Named for former Highway Department biologist and Game and Fish Commission Director Stephen Wilson, it was the first location where Arkansas darters were discovered in the state during construction of the bypass around Fayetteville. Set in an urban landscape, exclusion of fire and grazing animals had led to growth of dense understory vegetation, as shown in this photo from the winter of 2002. An ice storm in 2009 broke many limbs and small trees, 
turning the area into a near impenetrable tangle. For the Arkansas darters in the stream, this meant increased shading of the creek, which nearly eliminated the beds of aquatic plants that they live in. In 2011, the Northwest Arkansas Land Trust took ownership of this property and have since secured several grants for thinning of the woody vegetation in an effort to open the canopy and restore this area to a prairie savanna habitat. These efforts are improving habitat for the fish as well as for native prairie birds. The resulting Wilson Springs Preserve has become a popular nature recreation area for the community. Several spring tributaries feed Little Osage Creek between the city of Cave Springs and the Northwest Arkansas Regional Airport. This area is one of the few places where these two darter species occur together, and it is home to our, one of our largest populations of both species. The largest of the spring runs in this area is Healing Springs, a large spring upwelling that creates a one kilometer long spring run, joined by another three-fourths kilometer spring run midway to its confluence with Little Osage Creek. When the Arkansas Department of Transportation proposed replacement of the Highway 264 bridge that crosses Little Osage Creek immediately below its confluence with the Healing Springs Run, they needed to mitigate for the environmental effects of the road construction. Biologists from Arkansas Game and Fish, the Arkansas Department of Transportation, Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission, and the Nature Conservancy proposed the acquisition of the outlined property which was a former llama farm that was for sale at the time and includes a large portion of the two spring runs in this area. Efforts are ongoing to employ herbicide and fire treatments to restore native prairie savanna vegetation. This will become a natural area managed by the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission. Finally, I'd like to mention the Logan area near Osage Creek in southern Benton County. In this area, both of these species have been found in scattered portions of Gailey and Palmer Hollows, a pair of spring-fed tributaries of Osage Creek. These are both losing streams, having sections that become dry much of the year, with flow sinking into the groundwater only to reemerge as springs further downstream. Most locations in this area have one species or the other, Arkansas darters upstream and least darters downstream closer to Osage Creek. Adjacent to the Logan Cave National Wildlife Ref Refuge, is a property that the landowner was keen to preserve for future generations. This area includes a former fish hatchery, some pasture and poultry houses, and spring-fed backwaters of Osage Creek. It has recently been acquired by the Nature Conservancy. This area is the Arkansas Nature Conservancy's newest preserve. It protects an abundant population of least darters and a small population of Arkansas darters. Not yet open to the public, the Nature Conservancy plans to do restoration on the property and provide for low impact recreation. But there's still plenty to do. We need to continue to work with our partners to track darter population response to the restoration work at Wilson Spring over the long term, to pursue opportunities to partner with the city of Fayetteville to expand Arkansas darter habitats downstream of Wilson Spring along Clabber Creek, connecting to populations we discovered further downstream in public green space. We need to monitor and respond to development threats that continue upstream of the Healing Springs natural area. And of course, there are many more species that are needing attention. 
And with that, I will conclude and be glad to address any questions. Thank you, Brian. Uh, anybody, uh, I don't see anything in the comments yet. Feel free to type anything in there or just uh, unmute your microphone and throw a question out. So uh, I've, I've got a question if nobody else is going to ask it. If, for those that don't know, in 2005, Brian was uh, assisting uh, uh, Kelly Irwin with some uh, hellbender work, flipping over rocks and what have you in the 11 point river. And he found, uh, an unusual and interesting crayfish, uh, which has since, uh, uh been determined to be a previously unknown species and, uh, was, uh, very, uh, uh, it was named after Brian. It's a uh, Faxonius Wagneri, which is the 11 point river crayfish. So my question is, how cool is it to discover a previously unknown species and have it named after you? Well, it is very, very cool to, to find something that's not been recognized before. And it was surprising when the authors put my name on that crayfish. In the same paper, they, they described two crayfish and um, named one after me and one after the crayfish biology, biologist with the Missouri Department of Conservation. Unfortunately, the one that they named for him um, appears to be extirpated from the state of Missouri now. At least Arkansas still has mine, and hopefully it will for some time. All right. Any other questions? Uh, I don't see anything. Anybody you want to throw anything out there before we wrap things up? Hey Brian, this is uh, this is Ben Batten. Uh, appreciate the presentation. Uh, had a lot of impact on a lot of interesting species that definitely don't get enough credit in the state. So thanks for everything you've done uh, during your your career. I do have a question about the least darter. Uh, you know, you talked about obviously it. it uh, I don't know if I fully understand this or not, but uh, you were saying they're about eight percent different. You know, on average than than some of the other populations. Uh, and, you know, we always hear about how close like humans and bonobos and chimps and things are. So are, are those least darters uh, less similar uh, th than we are to some of our primate uh, relatives? And also then secondary question, are we just waiting on a publication to change some of that speciation or what's the long term path there? Um, it's tough to, to really compare the, the genetic similarities across different groups like that. But it definitely, 8% usually would be enough to, to be a distinct species. And yes, Dr. Fluker at Arkansas State is, is working on writing the publication to describe this, that species. And I, last time I talked with him, he expects it to be out sometime this year. Thanks, Brian. Um, Chris Racy says, great presentations, Marcus and Brian. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, spending uh, an hour with us and uh, hearing about our, our colleagues' incredible work uh, uh, this morning. Uh, thank you, Marcus, of course. Uh, and uh, special thanks uh, to Brian uh, for 32 years of service uh, to the state of Arkansas and our aquatic resources. Our, our state and those resources are definitely richer for, for your service. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Uh, that'll wrap things up. And uh, again, I appreciate everybody tuning in this morning and we will see you in July. So long, everybody.